unemployment is uh, up over, well over what it was during the sanctions. It was around, I think, roughly 33% during the sanctions. It's still well up over 50% at this point. Some estimates as high as 70%. Um, the healthcare situation now, uh, where during the 80s, Iraq had the uh, best healthcare system in the Middle East, hands down, uh, had some of the best trained doctors around. And, and the healthcare system today looks like a, a recent report uh, quoted Iraqi doctors as saying that people who go in the hospitals now in Iraq have an 80% chance of leaving with a, a disease, an infectious disease that they didn't have when they entered the hospital. There's a lot more to talk about than just that. Uh, the death squad issue is very, very serious. Maybe we can go into that more a bit later. But um, I want to make sure I have plenty of time and, and to give you an overview of future plans in Iraq. I think that's really important that people here have this information. Um, some of, much of this you probably already know, but I want to start with the embassy uh, in Baghdad. And I, I like to put that word in quotes because usually if you think of an embassy, you think of uh, a little white building with a small staff and maybe a gardener and a cook and people go in there and get their passports renewed or if they lose a passport, they go in there. Well, this embassy in Baghdad that's being built as we speak right on time First of all, it was a $592 million contract that was awarded to a very corrupt uh, Kuwaiti company. So once again, it's foreigners who are doing the, the work, not Iraqis who are getting the jobs. Uh, it's being built right smack in the middle of the green zone uh, in the middle of Baghdad. So people can look across the Tigris River, look up over the 15-foot blast walls that surround the green zone and see these towering cranes that are erecting 21 buildings with uh, walls reinforced two and a half times their normal standards. This complex will house over 8,000 government officials. Uh, it will have the, a, a gymnasium, the largest swimming pool in the country, barber and beauty shops, a first-run movie cinema, a food court with uh, fast, fast food uh, uh, outlets like we have on the bases. I'll get into that in a little bit and a commissary. There's a large-scale barracks for troops, a school, a school, locker rooms, a warehouse, a vehicle maintenance garage, six apartment buildings, and when it's finished, the site will be two-thirds the area of the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's going to be the size of the Vatican City. It's another comparison to give you an idea of how big this is. And unlike Iraq's infrastructure and so-called reconstruction projects there. This one's going off right on time. Again, think about that. Uh, the infrastructure information I gave you, Iraqis basically living in squalor in their own houses, camping in their own houses, and then they look across uh, the Tigris River at this, these cranes. They know very well what's being built in there, and, and how do you think that makes them feel? And then I, I think it's important to talk about the, the bases, the military bases in Iraq. There's uh, several of these. I'll get into the exact number in a little bit. But just to give you an idea of what kind of military bases the, the U.S. is building there, I want to start with one called Camp Anaconda. It's in Balad, which is just outside of Baghdad. It's north, northeast of uh, Baghdad. At this base alone, there's 20,000 U.S. soldiers, less than 1,000 of whom ever leave the base. There's two base exchanges where they have the latest high-tech gear so people can go in and buy high-definition televisions, iPods, brand new CDs, DVDs, this kind of thing. There's thousands of civilian contractors in this one base alone, which is typical of, of other bases. I'm just using this one as an example. But there's so many civilian contractors from Halliburton's subsidiary Kellogg Brown and Root that they have their own little neighborhood on the base of cluster of little uh, buildings where they live called KBR land. The hospital on this one base, again, keep, uh, keep in mind the, the figures I gave you for how many soldiers are killed and then the huge number that are being wounded every day. On this one base alone, there's 400 major surgeries a month on injured troops. There's meals served there by uh, what they call third country nationals in Iraq, TCNs. These are people, it's slave labor uh, in some it's basically people brought in from places like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, very, very poor countries to come in. So 
they basically pay them less than even what they would have to pay Iraqis uh, because it's better for profits. There's a bare minimum of six bases like this in Iraq. Some estimates have gone as high as 14, some have even gone higher than that. But I, I think the, the real number is going to be closer to around 10 or 12. It gets a little hard to say for sure because, for example, Camp Victory near the airport, well, now there's Camp Victory North, which is, it, 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 which is so big the bases have actually grown together. So is that two bases or is that one base? That's how big these bases are. They're absolutely massive. So there's no timetable for the Bush administration to pull out of Iraq. Why not? The 2002 National Security Strategy states, and, and this is right along the line of what Mill was talking about, quote, our forces will be strong enough to dissuade potential adversaries from pursuing a military buildup in hopes of surpassing or equaling the power of the United States. To accomplish this, the U.S. will require bases and, station, bases and stations within and beyond Western Europe and Northeast Asia. So we're seeing a, a new buildup now in Iraq. If we look to the future for where this is probably going, we look at Japan, where on the island of Japan alone there's 100 U.S. military installations. In South Korea alone there's 100 U.S. military installations today. And that is what's going on in Iraq. It's not about peace, it's not about finding a solution to uh, conflicts in the country or, or any of that stuff. It's about maintaining and broadening a permanent U.S. military presence in Iraq, using it as a beachhead to keep projecting that force deeper into the Middle East. And, and that's where we are today. And now the saber rattling is at Iran and, and Syria might be next on deck after that. I want to see Iraq free, but I think when we look at the forces which are involved and the depth of the commitment what we're talking about is a massive struggle. It's not a matter of just demonstrations. It's a matter of a, a bigger and deeper and stronger movement than the Western world has seen before. And that's going to take some time to build. Okay, and that's to do with the, you know, economic, that's the economic significance of Iraq. It's phenomenal to the United States. And uh, so that's kind of big picture. Little picture, one tiny little bit of what Dar was talking about is a as a result of a deal with the IMF last year, late last year, the Iraqi government is sort of slowly phasing out and monetizing the food ration in Iraq. Now that food ration has been keeping people alive since 1990 when the sanctions started. It's inadequate, you know. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqis died because it was inadequate. But it kept people alive. And now, this year, they're cutting the budget for the food ration by 25%, and they're reducing the amount that they're giving people. Um, so they are cutting subsidies on salt, soap, and beans. They're still giving people rice, sugar, flour, and cooking oil. But what's happening is, is they're moving to more of a free market solution. Prices go up. Millions of poor Iraqis depend on this. We're not going to get the United States out of Iraq in the next year, I would say. But we can restore that food ration. We can fight back against that. And I think that's something winnable, which means it's life and death for so many Iraqi families. I'm not saying we shouldn't oppose the occupation. Definitely. We should campaign against the occupation of Iraq. But I don't think we should just be so focused on the big picture, on the big win, that we ignore issues which are of immediate significance to millions of families in Iraq and are the difference between you know, just about getting by and destitution and hunger. The thought I'll leave you with is uh, I think mainstream media is a dinosaur and we need to help it die by not, not trying to rely on it or change it, but rather supporting independent media places like Democracy Now! and, and alternative information sites and radio and we can start doing that on a community level. And that's something people right now here can start doing on a community level. Uh, someone mentioned uh, bringing more information to people because I'm, maybe I'm naive, but I still believe that if people know the right thing, they'll do the right thing.